and welcome to another edition of Proselytize or Apostatize. My name is David Russell, and I'm here with my co-host, David Palman. What's up, David? How's it going, Russell? Good to be back on with another episode. Yes, sir. We also have a very special guest for you guys today during this uh, apologetic month that we got going on. It's Dr. Gary Habermas. How you doing, Dr. Habermas? I'm doing well. I hope you guys are, too. I'm looking out my window here on a little lake, and... Um... We have snow. We almost never have snow, but we have it. Yep. Well, you know, I'm in Spotsylvania, so I'm I'm kind of close to you. So yeah, we got it too. <laughs> we we yeah. got it over here in New York as well. Yeah. Yep. yeah, I saw I saw a warning that you guys up in New York are going to get blasted tonight or something. Oh wow. Yep. Good luck. Rumors David. are true. <laughs> Good luck, David. Uh, so yeah, so we're going by last names here, obviously again because we're both David and David, Doctor Habermas. So. Uh, yeah, why don't you just tell us a little bit about uh, yourself and your ministry and what you got going on right now? Oh, wow. Um, yeah, it seems like half my job is doing these interviews, and I mean that positively. I mean, there's just a lot of demand. I have probably been asked to do well over 20 interviews in just the last few weeks. I mean, very few weeks. And they're all long, and they're all detailed and they're on different subjects and I don't they're from six or seven countries and I don't get them done fast enough because I, I I try not to do more than one a day so they start writing back to me and going hey what's going on I want to get on let's hurry up <laughs> and uh, I, I think that means too that a lot of new websites I mean a lot of new YouTube sites are opening because when they send me their YouTube um, URLs, uh, a lot of them don't have very many interviews up yet. So I'm just thinking a lot of places are really starting to build up in this area, and there's a huge increase. That, you know, that's yeah, good. Yeah, that's a good thing. Yeah, I hear you. Uh, so, yeah, so today we, we wanted to talk to you about the historical Jesus. And I thought we would start out by uh, basically dividing it up into three sections. And the first section I want to do is establish that the Jesus that we know and the historical Jesus existed. And I, the reason I wanted to start here is because, you know, the Internet atheists have run amok with this uh, Jesus mythicism. And there are so many people that are being impacted on a lay level that it's just— it's mind blowing, and I thought that yeah, we gotta at least establish this. I just recently watched a, a video from uh, one of our uh, atheist uh, counterparts who is uh, called the Godless Engineer, and he's probably one of Paulman's favorite guys. But <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. but no, um, he uh, he he actually responded to you, and I was like, oh, you can't you can't harp on Doctor Habermas without uh. Huh me saying something so we're probably going to do a, a response video in the near future with that one but uh yeah so what's what's he uh what's he going after uh, what i mean what topic? oh he's kind of vulgar so he just said you're 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 full of you're full of it that's what he said when he he started looking yeah. at your arguments but you know that's that's some of these guys they just don't have anything of substance so they 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 kind of try to mix their own little humor and stuff into it little do they know they're doing bad historical uh, research and so forth. So, um, yeah. So that's kind of like yeah. where I wanted to start. And I'm going to, I'm going to hand it over to David real quick. He had the first question about this and I will let him go for it. Well, yeah. And again, it's just, uh, it's really great to have you on the show. So I'm uh, happy to have you here. But, um, when I was like in freshman year in college, uh, there was like Richard Carrier was the big deal. And I'm sure you've heard of him, but, uh, all the atheists, like, especially the mythicists would point to him as their big, their big PhD scholar historian who had, you know, definitively proved that um, Jesus never existed. Right. So kind of what are your basic thoughts on Carrier's work? Um, you know, what do you think? Uh, are his arguments really any good? Is he someone we need to take seriously? How do other scholars view him? What are your thoughts on Richard Carrier? Well, <clears throat> I often let uh, atheist and agnostic specialists do the talking for me. And as you know, many of the internet skeptics don't trust the specialists who are atheists and agnostics because they, they blow the 
the radical ones that are not scholars, they blow them away. And and Bart Ehrman has a long section on the mythicists uh, in his book, Did Jesus Exist? And he says, he says some of them, what they present are, la he calls them laughers. He calls them just, and he calls them worse names. I mean, not vulgar things, but he, he makes comments about them like they don't have a clue what's going on in the scholarly world. However, he does say that of all the thousands of religion, uh, New Testament, classical, historical type uh, professors that he knows who teaches religion, he said thousands. He said there's only two, basically, that have terminal degrees and are well respected. Those are Richard Carrier and Bob Price. And he says none of them, including those two, hold teaching positions and accredited university seminaries or colleges. Now, that book of Ehrman's that I'm citing came out a few years ago. So it's something could happen. I mean, it could have changed. Someone's going to get a place somewhere. But at the time of his writing, there weren't any to speak of. And uh, so Bart Ehrman goes off on him. He just says they're not respected. Um, he makes some derogatory comments. He could, he uh, basically says having one of these guys, not, not carrier or price, but he says having one of the real radical ones on your faculty would be like having a radical fundamentalist Christian, and the Christians aren't going to make it on our faculty, and neither are these guys. Kind of, I, I stretched that out a little bit, but that basically was where he was going. All right. Well, yeah. So you're saying we don't we don't even have to appeal to um, evangelical scholars to um, you know show that these guys are not you know that they're not even really well respected by. Um, even atheist scholars on the on the matter, right? And if I'm not mistaken, Price doesn't even have a degree in uh, historical studies. Uh, I, at least I heard his degree was in theology. Well, he's got two PhDs. One is in New Testament, and okay. one is in the, one is in theology, and they're from a good school, Drew University, in Philadelphia, I believe. And uh, actually, this is crazy. I'm I'm friends with a lot of these guys. And uh, I've been a friend with of Bob's for over 25 years. And uh, we write back and forth very respectfully. We don't talk a lot, but when we do, it's just like, you know, I talked to you last week and I'm fitting right in with you again. It's like two, two old hippies talking. <laughs> so, I mean, Bob's a real nice guy. He's got two PhDs. And, and, and uh, even Ehrman said, that he and Carrier, Carrier's field is classic slash ancient history, and Carry and uh, Price and Carrier are both given kudos by Ehrman for being well trained. You you fellas probably know uh, Price and Ehrman uh, debated. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. And uh, yeah, I don't know what ha I don't know I don't listen to debates anymore, but. Uh, don't know how it went. Okay. Oh, Ehrman won. Uh, Ehrman won. Uh, I've heard that, but you know, you don't often want to want to quote rumors and think that's absolutely what happened. But right. was it pretty? Was it pretty clear? Uh, in my opinion, yeah. yeah, I thought. Um, I thought. I it thought was. it was too. Uh, I, I give I give Bob uh, kudos for the way he presents and his uh, the way he he presents himself. So uh, that's always a, a good in a debate. So. But yeah, yeah, he's a, he's a good guy. He's a friend. I wish we were my next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. I mean, I wish we could get together for an occasional cup of coffee once a month. I mean, I would enjoy it. He invited me down to his home a few years ago, um, and I would just love to sit down with him and chat. I mean, that would be fine. Yeah. So, so Doctor Habermas, I do want to get into some of the claims that Carrier makes. I think it goes well into establishing whether the historical Jesus existed. Uh, Carrier sure. makes an argument. Uh, about the ascension of Isaiah and that it is what influenced Paul and that Paul didn't believe in the risen Jesus, but that Jesus was crucified in the heavenly realm. Why should we reject that as Christians and as uh, believers and, and historians? How about, how about just a one liner? Because there is either no 
well, I'll put the two commas together, no adequate historical data. And there's too much supposition in those comments. You cannot connect the two. Uh, listen, in philosophy, there's an argument. Uh, uh, it's, it's a methodological move, and it's often referred to as coherence. And two things can cohere, very much so, and neither can be true. Or they can cohere, and one could be true, and one could be false, etc. But coherence doesn't prove something. And so just because something is similar or it seems like somebody is is referring to that source, it doesn't that's so far from proving that it's not even methodologically, it's not a good place to go. Um, secondly, I would say my other point would be that the historical data for Jesus as a person is so strong. I mean, again, Bart Ehrman says it well. He says none of the thousands of specialists in appropriate areas, none of them, as far as he knows, thousands, believe that Jesus never existed. He said it's not even counted as a reputable view. Now, he again, he accepts Ehrman and Price. So he probably say, well, they've got good credentials. They can say what they want to. But I think he would keep saying, at least in, in the book, Did Jesus Exist? He would say, the specialist, they're not convincing any of the specialists. They might they might convince the people who are listening to their blogs who themselves, well, the two of them are trained. The people listening to their blogs, by and large, may not be trained, and they kind of lap this stuff up, but it's not impressing the scholars. That's that's what Ehrman says. All right. Yeah, you know, the, these guys, in several debates, these guys go after our sources, such as our patristic fathers and, and uh, the enemy attestation. The one I heard recently was that Josephus wasn't talking about James, the brother of uh, of Jesus of Nazareth, right? So he was talking about somebody else. Uh, do you have any good counter arguments for things like like that, or is it along the same lines? Yeah. How about how how about Josephus scholars utterly reject yeah. that? I mean, you know, I I, I do want to make a a pause yeah. here. Um, we, I I don't want to be guilty. Of rejecting arguments because quote unquote nobody agrees with you or because quote unquote the specialists don't agree the specialists can be wrong and not a, and truth is not settled by how many people agree with you but the implication is Bart Ehrman to Bart Ehrman if everybody in the field all the specialists do not take that view that doesn't prove it wrong but it might indicate that there are reasons against that position. And it's the reasons, just like my minimal facts argument on the resurrection. People think I, I argue from the weight of scholarly evidence. No, that's the second and much lesser point because that's just a methodological, don't argue with me, your own books say this. By far the most important point is the reason you ought not argue with me is because you're wrong on the data. The data determine whether this is true or false, not what Bart Ehrman says. I just want to be clear yeah. about that. Not what Bart Ehrman says, not what the reputation is, not the fact that no scholars in, in credit positions are going to agree with them. It's the evidence behind it. And I don't think that the mythicists have an historical, an evidential leg to stand on. Yeah. Okay, so uh, would that be the same then, like, how how do we know Eusebius got Papias right? You know stuff like that. How would we? How do we know that for sure? Or not even for sure for sure, but at least to a varying degree of probability. I guess what I'm trying to say is, how do we e evidentially establish who uh, or you know that Jesus existed? What is the best me method, and and how do we come to that data? Well, this might surprise people, but I've got a skeptical streak in me, and. Anybody who knows my testimony knows I've been there, done that for 10 straight years and another 10 after that. And it's all over the place that I had, uh, I, I considered Buddhism and thought at one point that I was very, very close to accepting Buddhism. But, but people often say, yeah, well, he was probably a kid when he did that. He's probably 15. No, that was post-PhD. 
post PhD. So I've grappled with a lot of these things and I have a skeptical streak. And having said that, David, I would say, I don't trust what Eusebius says. Um, could Eusebius be true? Yeah, he could be. But he writes 300 years after Jesus. Uh, you know, that's not the end of the world in the ancient historical world. I mean, you could be right, but that is not a good distance. Now, now the comet is, while well, he's citing Papias, and Papias could be writing as early as 110 AD. Most people put him at about 125, and that's only 25 years after the New Testament canon. That's a better argument. The thing is, though, who gives us Papias? And, of course, what we have in Papias is a bunch of fragments. So Papias is a great source, but we don't know much of what he said. His, if there's a book in the ancient world that we wished we had that's missing, it's probably Exposition of the Oracles of the Lord by Papias. But we have fragments. So since he's citing Papias, that's probably okay. But just when Eusebius is talking at plus 300 after Jesus, I don't think that's a good argument. I, I, um, I will list Clement, Ignatius, and Polycarp at uh, 95, 17, and 110 AD. But that's... I mean, that's right there at the end of the New Testament. I, I think there are a lot better sources for sure, but we don't get the papia stuff in them. So sorry for that yeah, little no, run on. But I, I would not base if, listen, if Eusebius were my major source of the resurrection, I would be in despair. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, you know, I, I'm going to take us out of the weeds here because the I think we addressed uh, this mythicist issue and uh Established that, yeah, it, we have very good evidence that Jesus existed, and now we can actually get to the good stuff. And I know you're going to love some of this stuff because I've heard you talk about it several times. But <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, how do we evidentially establish who Jesus was? What's you, you know who he said he was? Um, what is the best method to that approach? Even well, again, I would use a Bart Ehrman or a Garrett Ludeman atheist atheist specialist they don't have a christian axe to grind <clears throat> garrett ludeman says the resurrection of jesus and the fact that there were real experiences afterward those two things are indisputable in fact often this is often not known garrett ludeman says the that the evidence indicates and that's more important than Ger garrett ludeman or gary habermas say so it's that the evidence indicates this view for Ludeman. And he says, the experiences of the disciples were reported immediately after they happened. Immediately. Bart Ehrman says that the early Christian creeds, like 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and following, many of them are resurrection creeds, many of them. Ehrman says they could all have existed before Paul was converted. That means before plus two or three after the cross, that's when Paul's conversion is dated, plus two or plus three. Some dare to say as early as 18 months, but plus two or three is normal for either believers or skeptics. And he says the creeds possibly or probably, this is Ehrman, all came from Jerusalem. All were pre-Pauline pre -Pauline, uh, conversion. And Paul could have known about them ahead of time. That is early. And that beats any of the sources we're talking about from Clement and about 95 up to Eusebius. So I like to talk about those early sources and how we know those creedal sources are accurate. What makes Ehrman, there's a question, what makes Ehrman and Ludeman and many others, like Jewish New Testament scholars, Geza Vermesh, um, Pankus Lapid, uh, what makes, they're, they're both uh, passed away, but what makes people like that say this stuff is absolutely credible historically? Uh, uh, in fact, Pincus Lapid said the material in 1 Corinthians 15 is so reliable, you can treat it as a testimony of eyewitnesses. Mm. So, I mean, that's pretty heavy from two Jewish New Testament scholars and two other atheist New Testament scholars. 
All right, well, I'm going to hand it over to David again. He had another question that was coming up, and uh, yeah, then we'll get back to the early sources too. <laughs> Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, an important um, point with, uh, you know, uh, establishing Jesus's existence, establishing who he was, and even uh, to an important degree, uh, interpreting the evidence for the resurrection comes down to this uh, question of did Jesus view himself as deity? Did he view himself as God? Do we have um, good evidence to think that this was the sort of way that he viewed himself, right? Because if we just have like a resurrection of a random person, then that's that's a little uh, strange. It's difficult to know how to interpret that. But if you have this person uh, claiming to be divine, then that immediately gives us, I think, an additional reason to really consider the possibility of a resurrection. So do you think we have good evidence for thinking that Jesus claimed to be God? Okay, virtually everybody that I know of, evangelicals included, do not think that Jesus said at any one point, I am God. And maybe one of the reasons for that is the confusion that may have been caused by him saying, I am God. And they're saying, but God's up there and you're down here. And then you have to immediately opt into the Trinity. In other words, it's, it's, and the Trinity was a much later idea. Um, that didn't make it untrue, but the, what we call the formulation of the Trinity came later. In the New Testament, there are, let me be clear, there are three people in the two, three persons in the New Testament. Uh, they're traditionally called Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. They are all called deity in the New Testament. But to say it the way I would say it, Jesus claimed to be deity, yes. And he did that largely by his claims and his actions. And the claims he did make according to critical rules of attestation, he did make claims to be um, divine and a very high view of divine. This is not known so much about many of these critics, but a guy like Bart Ehrman, who thinks Jesus was adopted as a son of God, God took this man and exalted him. But what we don't realize is the way that the critics who take that view, the cr view, there's been a great book written against it by edited by Michael Byrd and a bunch of others from Zondervan that came out the same time as is um, uh, Urban's book on this subject. But what we don't realize is that the critics who say that, even though that view is rejected, that Jesus re was adopted, even though it's rejected by conservatives, the view presents a Christology that would wow a lot of people. Ehrman thinks, and a lot of other people think, that that story in the early church, that narrative, included the pre-existence of Jesus, a la Philippians chapter 2, which Philippians 2 has that phrase. It says Jesus was in the morphe of God, and the next verse, he's in the morphe of a servant. Now, whenever we do that, there are different views on exactly how the incarnation works, but the, the chief meaning of morphe, in, in English, morphe means form, and form can be something hollow, kind of an outline, kind of a roughed-in house that hasn't been filled in with drywall and a roof. But in Greek, the primary meaning of morphe has to do with nature. And in that early creed in Philippians chapter 2, it says Jesus was in the morphe of God. Now, Jesus didn't say that, but there's an early creed that affirms that. So the early creeds do affirm those things. My favorite example, Romans 10, 9, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in our heart that God's raised him from the dead, we'll be saved. Many New Testament scholars think that Lord is the loftiest term that is used in the New Testament. Jesus is called God, is literally called God, about a half dozen times, depending on the Greek syntax, in various New Testament epistles, he's called God. But they think that even that title, God, as it's cited in the creeds and whatnot, is not as lofty as being called Lord, primarily because Lord, Adonai, is the equivalent of the Hebrew word for Jehovah. So it's a loftier term. And Jesus is called Lord, Son of God, 
son of man. We ought never forget, son of man should not be treated lightly. Some people think son of man is as heavy as the other two concepts. And Jesus did claim to be son of man, son of God, so on. Yeah, that's awesome. I've, I've, I've always kind of odd that kind of these um, evolutionary ideas that like the, the deity of Christ was something that grew up over time. Um, like that's how it happened. It always seems to me that like as we trace church history, we start out with the high Christology and it's the lower Christologies that come in later. But that's yeah, so I appreciate cool. those insights. Yeah. Uh, Russell, I'm going to hand it back to you. All right. Yeah, look, guys, let me make a real, let me make, make a real quick comment about the last thing David just said. Um, one of the words going around, one of the sentences going around right now that is heavy with meaning is cited by Richard Bauckham, but he didn't get, he's not, a, it's not original with him. And many New Testament scholars would say this is true, but here's the sentence. The earliest Christology is the highest Christology. That is is incredible. That means that what comes out of the gates in approximately 30 AD, what comes out of the gates, uh, Romans 10, 9, if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord, that's an early creed. Philippians 2, an early creed. Romans 1, 3, and 4, shown to be the Son of God, Lord, Messiah, by virtue of the resurrection. Early creed. Coming out of the gates, he was more in the morphe of God. Coming out of the gates, he's called Lord. Christians believe that from the very beginning. That's a very high Christology. Very well. Yeah, you know, it's it's so funny that you're, you, you know, you jumped right into the what I was going to ask you uh, uh, about the creeds. I was going to ask you why, why are they so strong? Why are they, why are they good art, you know, good to incorporate into arguments and so forth? And uh, how do we know they're early, you know, and, and stuff like that? So, yeah, well, yeah. Do you want to spend a, yeah, we, we, could, we, we want to spend a week, well, week <laughs> on it? No, I mean, listen, guys, I teach a PhD course on the creeds and we don't get off the subject and don't finish it during a PhD wow. course. And they've got to write their research papers on the topic. It is loaded, loaded, loaded again, not because people say it is but because the data say it is. And, and the comments I'm making, many, many of the most skeptical New Testament scholars will not agree, disagree with what I just said. So how do we know? I, I think there's two major things that say your first question, David, as to why this the creeds are so important. Comment number one, they are, critics call them pre-Pauline. Now there's two senses, I don't want to get too involved, but there's two senses of pre-Pauline. One, the, the more conservative sense is pre-Pauline in the sense of they were circulating before Paul became a believer. They even predate Paul. So that you are not allowed to say, yeah, Paul made those things up. He's the one that invented the deity of Christ. Baloney, read your books, read the data. Uh, that's really early pre-Pauline. That makes it between 30 and 32, 30 and 33 A.D. And if you take a 33 AD date for the crucifixion, it makes no difference. Then it's between 35 and 36, but the same gap of two to two to three years. The other kind of pre-Pauline means it simply has to predate Paul's epistles. And the first one is probably First Thessalonians, about 50 AD. So that's an old. I mean, that's like a like a not one of the earliest creeds. If it only goes to 48 or 50 AD. You go, how do you know these things? Well, there's a place after which they can't be dated. And that is when they're mentioned in the earliest Pauline creeds, they're obviously earlier than the creeds in which they're written. So that tells you right there. But you know that there's got to be a reason when an Ehrman and a Ludeman and others say, yeah, these things were in the works and around and could be quoted before Paul was converted. He was probably... It probably made him very angry, being an Orthodox Jew. So that's one thing. High Christology from a very early date coming out of the gate. Secondly, you go, how do we know that? Best argument, it's only now being circulated. Most evangelicals, it does not even appear in their textbooks. If someone said to me, where is the best argument for these things? Uh, is it the Gospel of John? I'd say no. I would use Mark 
14, 61 to 64, Jesus before the high priest. But even that is not as is is strong an argument, in my opinion, as uh, using here what Paul describes in Galatians 1 and 2. There are seven of the uh, books that bear Paul's name that critics will take at face value. They don't mean, that doesn't mean they're inerrant or inspired. That just means they're great sources. And one of those seven is Galatians. Paul says he went up to Jerusalem three years after his conversion. That's going to be plus five or plus six after the cross. He goes up to Jerusalem and spends 15 days with Peter and James, the brother of Jesus. Uh, by the way, that objection earlier, David, on, on this Josephus mentioned James. Um, I've got one source here by a major New Testament scholar who says it's a unanimous view among scholars. And that's not quite the, the case, but it's very close. Why are we going to cite Josephus when we can cite the fact that Paul is unquestionably taken to be authentic, and he spent that time in Jerusalem with James at plus, plus two or three years, well, two or three years, after his, three years after his conversion, plus five or six total. And he talked about the gospel in Galatians 1. How do you know? Well, that's the theme of the whole book of Galatians. But if you have a question, he goes back to Galatians he goes back to Galatia in Galatians 2, first 10 verses, and he specifically says, I put before them the gospel I was preaching. And Paul says over and over again, Romans 1, Romans 10, the gospel he preached involved the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So when he's there with Peter and James in Jerusalem at plus five or six, and then when he goes back the second time, still before the book of First Thessalonians, still pre-Pauline, John is now there. Why is that significant? Because the big four are present. Paul, Peter, James, the brother of Jesus, and John. And Paul says twice in those 10 verses in, in uh, Galatians 2, they agreed with my message as the message I should take to the Gentiles. They agreed with my message. That combination of super, super early, super, super high proclamations Second point, confirmed by the big four at a very early date. You got that? You got it. That's the main argument. Early data confirmed by the guys, the guys, the big four, at a very early date. Wow. Yeah. David, you got anything on that you to say about that? I'm going to turn it over because I've been kind of hogging it, David. So uh, you've been hitting like one or two questions here and there, but you got the list of questions that we had. So I'm going to let you uh, uh, take a little bit from me there. All right. No, no, it's been awesome. Uh, but now we're going to kind of turn, I think, this interview towards, uh, you know, zero in on Dr. Habermas's uh, area of expertise, and that's going to be uh, the resurrection. So uh, Dr. Habermas, you've kind of become known for this minimal facts approach to the resurrection. So uh, if you could just, you know, kind of quickly lay that out for uh you know anyone who'll be watching and uh, who maybe just isn't familiar with it kind of what what does that case look like and what are these minimal facts yeah i, li I like the way you say <clears throat> can we do it quickly i know you're not being derogatory <laughs> but in a funny way it sounds like yeah can you do this quickly i mean like a little faster than you have been doing these things <sighs> um i could go on and on and on the minimal facts argument illustrates what we started at the beginning of the program when when david first asked me um, what do we think about the mythicists? And I and and I, so I. Uh, what do we think? I'll give the opinions of atheists and agnostic specialists. What do we think? But what it's based on are the data. The minimal facts argument starts with those two points. By far, the most important one is. I will use no fact that is not multiply evidence. Now, don't confuse multiple evidence with multiple textual attestation. Multiple attestation is one kind of what I mean by multiple evidence, because multiple evidence could be multiple attestation plus archaeology, for example. That would still be multiple arguments. And there are many multiple arguments for each fact I will use. Multiple arguments for each. In fact, I'm going to say something really bombastic. I often use what I call a six plus one 
argument. Mike and I, Mike Lacone and I, in our bookcase for the resurrection, called it a four plus one. The numbers change all the time. You go, why do the numbers change? Because nobody only grants that few facts. So if there's a case where I need a couple more of them, I usually start out with 12 and then cut them down to six. But one of the 12 that I don't use in the six is the empty tomb. It doesn't quite make my criteria for the minimal facts. But the evidence for the empty tomb, there is many evidences for the empty tomb as there is for almost any other of the minimal facts. Then why don't you include it? Because the second point, which is lesser, that the second point is not quite as... The, the second point is because the facts are so good, almost all critical scholars agree with it. The agreement on the empty tomb is high, about two-thirds to three-quarters. But it's not as unanimous as the other six. And if I use those six plus one, only the evidence, not where the critics are, six plus one, there are over 100 separate morsels of data for saying those seven, six plus one, are true. Over 100. You go, how do you get to over 100? That's a joke. Well, I mean things like, yeah, I'm being real picky. If I count every creed that is apropos. You could say, well, no, I think we should count the creedal arguments as one. That's fine. I'm okay with that. But if we broke everything down into their component parts, over 100 reasons to accept these six plus one. So I'll take the facts, which are the most heavily evidenced, and therefore, except for the empty tomb, they're virtually unanimously accepted by critics. Throw the empty tomb in there. And they're usually that's usually accepted by critics. So that's that's the way I use the argument. Multiply evidence is by far the most important. Attested by almost everybody is a good starting point, is a methodologically good point to begin. Awesome, awesome. Thanks so much for that. All right, I'm getting echo over here, Russell. Yeah, but uh <laughs> all right. Uh, all right. So then uh, we got some more specific questions here, uh, just on some of the points for your case. Uh, specifically, uh, just how likely do you think it would be that Christianity could, uh, you know, just get off the ground in first century Palestine? Right. Uh, what is the likelihood of that happening? And Russell, this is one of your questions. So I don't know if you wanted to add in there that like, with, without the resurrection, how likely is it that it could have happened? Because uh, you just have here, how likely is it that it would have happened? Oh, well, yeah. I'll go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead Dr. Habermas. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, I, I keep citing guys like Vermesh, uh, Lapid, Ludeman, uh, Ehrman, because they're non-Christians. And, and I do that so that people don't say, you prejudiced fundamentalists, you only cite all your preacher buddies and what you say in a church and you don't have any data. So I cite them and I say, argue with Ehrman, argue with Ludeman. They take your view in general naturalism, but they don't agree with your specifics here. Um, so I, I love it when a Bart Ehrman says, I am going to cite New Testament scriptures. Why? Because I think they're inspired. Ha! Huh, no way. I'm not a Christian. Uh, why? Because the Gospels are reliable? No way. I don't think the Gospels are, are, are reliable. Then why do you keep citing these verses over and over? Bart Ehrman's asking this question. People want to know why he's citing verses. Ehrman says, I'm a specialist. I know which verses are probable and are weighted by good evidence. They're the ones I cite. I've checked this out with biologists. I'm not sure it's a great illustration, but it's it, something like this. Why can a spider run across its net and never get caught? Presumably, the spider knows which strands it can run on and which ones it can't, or somehow immune, you know, but it knows the difference. Ehrman says, I don't quote these things because they're good texts. The, the, as a whole, I cite them because these individual passages like Galatians 1 and 2 and the creeds are well attested. That's where I'm, that's the view I'm taking too. I often, when I'm at a university campus, I'll often hold up a little New Testament I bring and I'll say, hey, 
you guys tell me, and I'm, I'm sometimes co-sponsored by both an atheist group on campus and an evangelical group on campus. And they'll both come up and introduce their groups before we start. And I'll hold up a New Testament. I'll say, hey, all of you, tell me about what you think. If the Bible is inspired, was Jesus raised from the dead? And all together, everybody in the room goes, well, yeah, if it's inspired. Okay, good. That's fine. If it's reliable, is Jesus raised from the dead? And they'll go, well, it depends on what part's reliable. And that's entirely true. That's a good response. What's re reliable? But I'll ask, what if it's unreliable? What if our Bible is Bart Ehrman's Bible? Gulp. You still get a resurrection. My argument is, Yes, you still get a resurrection because my Bible, it, the Bible that Ehrman and and Burmesh and, and uh, Lapid and Ludeman and many others accept, is the argument from which the minimal facts are drawn. That's another way to say that's what the minimal facts are. So you can believe the Bible is inspired. That's great. You can get some good books on reliability. That's good. But I'm saying if you start at the lowest methodological point, you can still get deity, death, resurrection, what we call the gospel. Awesome. All right. So what about this issue of um, the hostility of the environment that Christianity um, comes about in, right? It's birthed in an environment that's not really friendly towards it. Specifically, how does that argue in faith? or does it argue in favor of uh, the resurrection at all? The fact that it comes about in this, um, you know, this environment that is really, it, it goes against the grain of it, and in some ways it's being persecuted. Yeah, I, I'm not exactly sure where you're coming from, but I think, if, I, if, I, if I'm guessing correctly, what I'm thinking is <clears throat> the environment is getting tougher, so we're going to have to major on the major and minor on the minor. The center of Christianity is what we call the gospel. Traditionally, the definition of the gospel includes the facts of the deity, death, and resurrection of Jesus. You say, well, what about the what about buried, buried and rose? Well, buried, for example, is only mentioned maybe half the times in the definite gospel definitions in the New Testament, chiefly, by the way, in Paul's writings and in the early sermon summaries in Acts. But Deity, death, resurrection. I think we should major on that and not let people get off the subject, certainly not to political things, but not to happenstance and I hate you guys. And, and I mean, when people say that to us, we can't let that be a going off point and start, you know, letting the conversation drop down into a kind of, you know, ad hominem. I think we ought to have to keep our cool all the time and stay on the gospel. We generally only have a short time to speak. In an interview like this or on a university campus, we only have a short time to speak. So stay on what's ultimately important. So if someone during a Q&A says, well, what do you do with the genocide passages in the Old Testament? I'll often tease and I'll say, uh, what what's your point? Well, there's genocide passage in the Old Testament. I said, well, that's beside the point if they're there, but what's your point? Well, that's not good. Yeah, I get that. So what's your point? Is that the Bible you accept? And they've missed everything I've said. Because I'm saying whatever Bible I accept. Yes, I accept the Bible as scripture. But whatever Bible I accept, the Bible of the, the New Testament of the minimal facts... We can talk about the so-called genocide patches later. We've got a PhD student here who has had, I believe it's 45-ish hours at the MA-PhD level of Greek and Hebrew. He's doing his thesis on the Old Testament. He's an Old Testament specialist. He's doing his dissertation on the, on the, uh, on the, the so-called genocide passages. So can we... Can we deal with those things? Yes, we certainly can. But let's major on the major. So when you ask me about genocide, I'll say, ask me next week. Have me back. But I've only got a short time here. Well, you just don't want to treat the genocide passages. No, it's that I do want to treat the gospel. Great. Talking about the genocide passages will not determine where you are vis-a-vis -vis God. 
And if you think the genocide passes are a difficult one, try resurrection with the naturalist. So I am going for the hardest thing I can go for, but it also happens to be the center. That's a great strategy. I, I like that. Uh, so kind of Russell, well, all right, we think we got a couple of fun questions here in closing. Uh, Russell, you want to ask yours? Well, yeah, first, because we're, we're pretty much concluded there uh, with the, the, the interview section, the actual, all the questions. And I love uh, interviewing you, Dr. Habermas, because you answer a lot of my questions without even me having to ask the questions. So I've had to, yeah. I've had to eliminate some of them, you know, so, uh, but you, you know, okay. So just for fun, you know, there's this claim that I hear a lot of the skeptics make, right? That, well, I'm not a Jesus mythicist, mythicist. I'm a mythicist on who Jesus claims that he was and i think you pretty much answered it by saying hey whatever bible i have you know i haven't i have a resurrection you know <laughs> you know or whatever you know right. so i i think that that's a good strategy uh and so i was going to go to the to the shroud and and to see how conf, confident you are for our audience to see how confident you were on uh its authenticity yeah by the way you guys have made several comments about preempting your questions i've not seen your questions ahead of time yeah. so that means that means great minds run in the same line i guess that's what that means um the shroud i make some of my shroud friends uneasy uh i've co-authored two books on the shroud my co-author ken stevenson was one of the original team members who did the 1978 investigation in in turin he was an air force professor at the time Air Force Academy, and okay, so I, I'm there with Ken. He's on the bottom floor of the research, and I only tell people that when they say, what do you think about the shroud? Here's my funny little answer. I'll say, uh, what day is this? Uh, is it warm? Uh, no, it's snowing outside. Well, that's cool, because I like snow, too. Okay, I'm probably pretty positive today because it's a nice day outside. You know, what day did, what side of the bed did I get up on? And I'm just teasing people. Um, my view of the shroud, there's some play in the shroud because whenever you throw your hat in the ring of scientific data, you've got to put up with the scientific data. And the scientific data on the shroud fluctuate. However, I think there's a fairly decent chance the shroud is what it claims to be, the burial garment of Jesus Christ. Um, maybe I could say it this way. Some friends of mine, totally unbeknownst to me, just published a feshrift in my honor, uh, a book that's a bunch of well-known folks um, write comments about one of my areas of research, like the shroud or the resurrection or near-death experiences. By the way, Dale Allison contributed a chapter to that book. We, we've been friends and and Bob Price could have. I mean, I didn't put the list together, but but one of the guys who did a chapter is Barry Schwartz. Barry Schwartz has the best known shroud site in existence. And for the listeners, it's called shroud.com. And if you want to see the best photographs available and hear in pro and con views, go to Barry's site. Why am I bringing this up? Barry is a non-Christian Jew from an Orthodox Jewish family. He believes the Shroud of Turin is the actual burial garment of Jesus. He's been saying this for, if I could, I have a, I have an article that he does an interview and he affirms this way back in 1982. So he's been saying it for at least 40 years. He believes it's Jesus. He does not have a religious ax to grind. He's not a Christian. And he believes it's Jesus' burial garment. Now, when I say to him, we've talked for hours and hours. And when I say, Barry, is the image on the shroud the resurrection? He might just quip. He might just say something funny like, well, golly, I hope not, you know, or something like that. And I'll say, well, what do you do with all the data that it's the image is radiation? He'll say, well, I think there's some other theories that at least make some sense. But, you know, I'm hoping for a good naturalistic theory on, on the on the resurrection part, but not on the part of it being Jesus' burial garment. So I think there's a fair amount of probability there, but my, my views go up and down. Sorry to do that so much, but I just want to say it in context so I don't get quoted <laughs> out of context later. Uh, that's going to happen probably anyway. That's what everybody tries to do with, with 
<laughs> you know, That's it's, right. It's insane it, how much of that actually goes on. But uh, just I, I do have a question from a fan, and you know, feel free to just say no comment. But uh, they asked me to ask, where are you at on the magnum opus? Um, it's mostly done. Here's a bunch of little short comments. It's mostly done. It's very, very long. <laughs> it makes me weary. I start on my computer in the morning. In the last week, I have probably gotten off my computer more so than not after 12 o'clock a.m. So I'm on my computer a lot. I have thousands of pages still to edit. I can't really put it out there till it's edited. And I haven't even found a publisher. I haven't really started looking. I've had some publisher come to me and say, can we do it? But I've not, that's not because I've had any involved conversations or been looking. Um, long way to go, can be very slow. But data-wise, people are going to be surprised. Um, 150 pages, I think, on the historicity of Jesus. 150 pages, refutations of David Hume's essay on miracles and where we are right now. Um, almost 100 pages of historical data for the death of Jesus, the physical death of Jesus. Over 100 pages on mythological theories. And is, are there pre-Christian uh, death and resurrection of Messiah stories in pre-Christian texts. And I do each of the minimal facts, a chapter each, and they very frequently have more than 100 footnotes, sometimes 200, just for those individual events. So it's very, very long, and I have a very long way to go. I just hope the Lord leaves me here long enough to Well, if he does, it. I'd like a signed copy, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, I had a guy write to me. I don't even know. I don't even know him. He wrote to me. He said, "Warn me when that thing's coming out. I want to get a second mortgage on my house." <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. Well, Doctor Habermas, uh, we again, you, you know, your your ministry and you know your teachings have have greatly blessed my life, and I, I'm sure uh, David Palman can attest to that too. Uh, and we loved having you on here. We we really thank you for uh, making the time for us during this uh, hectic season, uh, and and writing the magnum opus. So, oh, and we we got to ask him oh, one okay. more question, okay. the last question, because 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 we know we know that Russell is he's a big presuppositionalist, no. No. and so obviously you know that a magnum opus that you're writing that's a lot of evidence. So I feel like that's going to rub him the wrong way. And uh, Nick Nick Peters has told me that you're you're not exactly a fan of presuppositionalism. So real quick, what are your thoughts on presuppositional apologetics? Well, I'll tell you what. Instead of giving you my view, let me tell you a quick little story that may just blow your guys' mind. Years ago, uh, I got to be good friends with Greg Bonson. Greg at that time probably still, he probably still has a reputation of being the most learned presuppositionalist, classical presuppositionalist in the last generation. I mean, you can take Van Til, but, but Greg is a, a great interpreter of Van Til's uh, before he passed away. And he heard me give my minimal facts argument for the first time. And I, we had dinner that night. And I said, what do you think, Greg? Are you totally against this because you don't like evidence? And he said, you misunderstand me. I have no problem with the evidence. I love evidence. In fact, he said, I think your argument is a presuppositionalist argument. And I almost choked. And I said, come again? He goes, no, no, no. Hear me out. He said, presuppositionalists are famous for taking their critics' arguments and turning them back against them. He said, you're taking the New Testament critics and establishing points that on their testimony, on our testimony, it comes short of the word of God. But in their testimony, there's still a resurrection. Conclusion, there's still a resurrection. He said, I love your argument. I said, well, Greg, I don't consider it a presuppositional argument for a number of reasons, but thank you for saying so. So anyway... Greg Bonson had no problem with that. One time he was in my home some years later, and he told me he had no problem using resurrection evidence with unbelievers while he was witnessing. That's a second strong comment from Greg Bonson. All right. He just went up in he my book. Up. <laughs> there you go. 
<laughs> oh yeah, David. David has a problem with pre-suppers. We had an open mic night here, uh, not too long, a couple days ago now, uh, and we had a presuppositionalist come on our open mic and just kind of, yeah, kind of uh, barge just there with his uh, long-winded speeches there uh, and his uh, his methods so i had to kind of cut him short <laughs> yeah well all anybody has to do is read the five u books from zondervan and they'll see what i think about presuppositional arguments i kind of go off on them too but i'm just saying that if we're going to stick to the heart of the message with the deity death and resurrection van Til, frame bonson montgomery geisler craig moreland the whole crew we agree on that central message and the good evidence is for it. I don't know anybody in that group that would disagree with that. Oh, awesome. awesome. Well, thank you again, Dr. Habermas, for taking the time out for us. And is there anything you want to add, a plug-in for any websites, any anything like that? Uh, the only thing I would say is anybody who wants to to track some of this stuff way more than we could do today, I, I'll give them two sources. One is my website, GaryHabermas.com. And the other one is we just recently put up a YouTube channel. It's just getting started. It's only been up and running for, it's been up for a few months, but I mean a very few months, but up and running with things actually being put on it probably for two months max. And it's just go, getting going. But people can go there and, you know, see it in action. There's a lot of uh, action. There's also debates, other things, audio and video and bo book publications. Two of my three books on doubt are on my website, free of charge. Nothing's for sale on my website. So those two, my YouTube site, look up my name, and then GaryHabermas.com for the website. Appreciate you asking that. Yep. And again, thank you so much, David. Uh, do you have anything to add? We have another interview coming up. Uh, uh, today actually or yeah we have another interview coming up today with uh jay warner uh to, this month is guest host month uh as uh you know you guys know we are here for you we're not here for ourselves we're here for you and this is your month to help us host debates and discussions so whatever you want you just send me a pm and we will make an arrangement so with that, David, I am going to close the show. Uh, everybody have a good day. Thanks again, Dr. Havernas, for coming on. Enjoyed it, fellas. Enjoyed it very much.